Of all the groups who represent the diversity of humanity in June's far-flung future, it is the Fremen and the Sardaukar who perhaps most represent the evolution of mankind, in terms of natural selection, or rather more accurately, in terms of the concept of survival of the fittest. Both groups represent human beings who have gone through considerable trials of hardship where the severity of their lives has led to the development of incredible fighting and survival skills, making them the two diverse groups of humans most to be feared in the Imperium. The Sardaukar are the Emperor Shaddam IV's elite shock troops, feared by virtually everyone in the Imperium, and ultimately the source upon which most of his direct power is reliant within the political triumvirate that rules the known universe. The Emperor, the Spacing Guild, and the Houses of the Landsrad. His dependency upon his legions of Sardaukar is ultimately linked to the power of the Spacing Guild, without whom he is unable to transport his men across the vast distances of the Imperium. With almost all of his legions of Sardaukar on Arrakis at the time of Paul's insurrection, he is left in a critically weak position. The Emperor is only able to survive politically by allowing Paul to engage in a marriage to his daughter Irulan which will allow him to ascend to the throne, while Shaddam IV retires to Seleucus Secundus with his remaining Sardaukar as a personal bodyguard. Seleucus Secundus is the third planet of the Gamma Wei Ping system, and as a world is greatly significant in understanding not only the development of the Sardaukar in Dune as elite warriors, but also provides a mirror image to both the Fremen as a people and the nature of the world of Arrakis and its ecology. Early in June, Paul asks his Mentat teacher Thufir Howitt if he knows of Seleucus Secundus, stating that it sounds much like Arrakis, perhaps not quite as bad, but much like it. In the appendix of June entitled Terminology of the Imperium, we learn that Seleucus Secundus became the capital of the Imperium after House Carino's ascendancy, following the Battle of Corin near Sigma Draconis. Seleucus Secundus is up to a certain point a normal habitable world, but after the use of atomics on the planet, the royal court is transferred to the new capital of Kaitian. From this point on, Seleucus Secundus is barely habitable, with incredibly harsh living conditions, and as such becomes the Imperium's prison planet. In the terminology of the Imperium, it is also noted that Seleucus Secundus was the second stopping point in migrations of the wandering Zen Sunni, and that Fremen tradition says they were slaves on Seleucus Secundus for nine generations. During the visions of other memory whilst undergoing the spice agony, Jessica discovers the transient nature of the Fremen people, who are also referred to in the past as the Zen Sunni wanderers. She notes in her visions that there had been Fremen on Poritrin, she saw, a people grown soft with an easy planet, fair game for imperial raiders to harvest and plant human colonies on Bella Tejus and Seleucus Secundus. One of the mysteries in Dune is the question from where does the Emperor recruit his elite shock troops, the Sardaukar, and why they are such exceptionally tough warriors, almost universally feared by all. The Emperor raises levies from the populations of various worlds, but the major houses of the Landsrad still maintain their own standing military forces. Both members of House Atreides, who see potential allies in the hardened Fremen if the need should arise to fight against the Sardaukar, and House Harkonnen, who are secretly using the Emperor's legions against House Atreides, speculate on the nature of these warriors and their origins. It is Paul's father, the Duke Leto, who is seemingly on the right track as to their origins and training. Despite the fact that speculation on the origins of the Sardaukar and of the Emperor's prison planet Seleucus Secundus are heavily discouraged, Duke Leto has been able to perceive, though not necessarily prove, a connection between the two. It is in the relationship between the harshest of environments of the prison planet and the toughness and ferocity of the Sardaukar wherein he sees such a connection. As Paul notes to his father that Seleucus Secundus is a hell world, Leto replies, undoubtedly, but if you were going to raise tough, strong, ferocious men, what environmental conditions would you impose on them? Despite most people believing that Seleucus Secundus is a hellish prison world, even the Baron Harkonnen commenting to the captured Thufir Howitt 
that the planet is merely a penal colony and that it is a place where the worst riffraff in the galaxy are sent, few are able to make the connection between the planet and the Emperor's shock troops. Thufir takes a degree of pride in realising that his own duke, now dead, had been able to discern that which the Baron, despite his aptitude for Machiavellian politicking, has not been able to figure out. That conditions on the prison planet are more oppressive than anywhere else, Howitt said. You hear that the mortality rate among new prisoners is higher than 60%. You hear that the Emperor practices every form of oppression there. You hear all this and do not ask questions? The Emperor doesn't permit the Great Houses to inspect his prison, the Baron growled, but he hasn't seen into my dungeons either. And curiosity about Salusa Secundus is. ah, how it put a bony finger to his lips. discouraged? So he's not proud of some of the things he must do there. How it allowed the faintest of smiles to touch his dark lips. His eyes glinted in the glow tube light as he stared at the Baron. And you've never wondered where the Emperor gets his Sardaukar. It is interesting to note that Thufir, albeit too late at this point, understands why the Emperor aided the Baron to help destroy his own cousin, Leto Atreides. The Emperor, albeit sometimes in a weak political position within the narrative of Dune, is still quite powerful because of his Sardaukar. It is the realisation that Leto, who is politically and publicly a popular man within both the population of the Imperium and the political body of the Houses of the Landsrad, may attempt to build an army to rival the Emperor's Sardaukar. Duke Leto knew that Arrakis as a world was every bit as terrible a place as Seleucus Secundus. Knowing this brought the revelation that the Fremen as a people represented a military force that was the potential of a core as strong and deadly as the Sardaukar. It was for this reason, coupled with the wealth that the Spice Melange offered, that House Atreides willingly walked into the trap that awaited them on Arrakis. The Emperor's decision to attack House Atreides alongside the Harkonnens emanates from an inadvertent and seemingly innocent slip of the tongue by the Baron when discussing Arrakis with Shaddam IV's agent and friend, Count Hazemir Fenring. He tells the Count that he has the Emperor's prison planet to inspire him in his management of Arrakis, helping to develop a substantial workforce. Fenring curiously questions the Baron further, but is aware that the Baron has not made the connection. The Emperor is aware of House Atreides' actions prior to their takeover of Arrakis in training a small elite force, and his fears are piqued with the understanding of the harsh environmental conditions on Arrakis. The Padishah Emperor turned against House Atreides because the Duke's war masters, Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho, had trained a fighting force, a small fighting force to within a hair as good as the Sardaukar. Some of them were even better, and the Duke was in a position to enlarge his force to make it every bit as strong as the Emperor's. The Baron weighed this disclosure, then, what has Arrakis to do with this? It provides a pool of recruits already conditioned to the bitterest survival training. The Baron shook his head. You cannot mean the Fremen. I mean the Fremen. The realisation that the harsh environment of Seleucus Secundus, coupled with intense military training and combined with an applied level of mystique and a sense of superiority, eventually leads the Baron to the true nature of the Sardaukar and the sudden realisation that indeed the Fremen represent a fighting force that are seemingly not just their equal, but are in fact far superior. This sudden realisation, and understanding that it was in fact the reason behind the Emperor obliterating House Atreides, brings the Baron Harkonnen to the conclusion that his own house is also in danger from such a threat, and that he will have to sacrifice his nephew Raban, present Governor of Arrakis, in order to preserve his own safety and that of his house. The Sardaukar are indeed former prisoners who have survived the terribly harsh environment of Seleucus Secundus and then given the very best of training. They are shaped by their environment, moulded by extreme training, provided with the best equipment, and have their sense of superiority bolstered by their own mystique and membership of a secret and elite cadre. The Sardaukar, when not in direct service to the Emperor, such as being engaged in military activities, 
live what could be considered a soft lifestyle, with Howitt noting that the commonest Sardaukar trooper lives a life, in many respects, as exalted as that of any member of a great house. The Fremen however are a greatly superior fighting force to the Sardaukar. The Fremen view the Sardaukar as being good fighters, and it is interesting to note that apart from the Atreides, most see the Fremen as harmless peasants. The exception to this is the Sardaukar, who after losing a number of engagements to the Fremen, believe that they are a serious threat. When the Baron is told of this by his nephew Raban, he is disbelieving, theorising that the men who engaged the Sardaukar must have been Atreides' troops disguised as Fremen. Raban seems to agree with his uncle, but informs him that the Sardaukar already have launched a pogrom to wipe out all Fremen. Apart from living on a planet whose environment can kill an unprotected human very swiftly, the Fremen have very little in common with the Sardaukar. They do have a mystique that settles around them when they escalate their guerrilla war against the Harkonnens under Paul Moadib's leadership. The Fremen are known as the Zen Sunni warriors, a people who have been on the receiving end of forced migrations over thousands of years before they eventually arrived on Arrakis. The Reverend Mother Romalo tells Jessica that they are the people of Messir, and that since our Sunni ancestors fled from Nilotic al Uruba, we have known flight and death. Herbert based the Fremen heavily on cultures that emanate from desert regions. Their language is heavily influenced by Arabic, and their Zen Sunni religion is a hybrid created out of the combination of Zen Buddhism, Sunni Islam, and Sufism. Although there are other cultural, linguistic and religious influences used by Herbert to create the Fremen, these have primacy in their makeup. In particular they seem to be very similar to the Bedouin and the Bushmen of South Africa. The Fremen as a people are completely interconnected to the ecology of Arrakis, adapting their laws, customs, religion and just about every other aspect of their lives in order to survive on the harsh desert world. Their religion is fundamentally linked to the great sandworms of Arrakis, who they view to an extent as both the creator and adversary from typical monotheistic religions. It is sometimes amusing to consider that the Fremen use their deity as a form of transport, travelling in the deep desert upon the backs of sandworms. Their prized sacred weapons are also related to the sandworms, the deadly Chris knives that they carry being made from the teeth of the gigantic creatures. In addition, their society's goals are focused upon creating a lush, Eden-like world out of the harsh desert planet that is their home, and they are seriously dedicated to this in the long term, knowing that it may take thousands of years. The necessity of conservation of water informs every facet of their culture, from their development of still suits as clothing, to the nature of their value systems. A Fremen's wealth is entirely based on water, which they carry for the good of their tribe. An individual who has no practical use to the Fremen would be viewed in terms of the water in their body and killed for it. In showing respect or honour, a Fremen may shed a tear, as Paul does for Jamis at his funeral. Upon agreeing to a loose alliance at his first meeting with Duke Leto Atreides, Stilgar spits on the floor to show his sincerity, an action that is very nearly misinterpreted by the Duke's men as an insult. Fremen who live in cities and towns, rather than in the desert, are often derogatorily referred to as being water fat. The Fremen therefore are a people that have been totally integrated to the ecological systems of a planet that is considered by the Imperium to be perhaps the single harshest habitable world in the known universe. Their environment has presented them with that simplest of evolutionary choices, adapt or die. The Fremen have adapted with superb efficiency and integrated the knowledge of their world's ecology by necessity into every single facet of their lives. The harshness of their life means too that those no longer useful to the tribe and unable to look after themselves are left to the desert, the most common example being the blind. The Fremen are physically notable by their blue within blue within blue eyes, also known as the eyes of Ibad a result of melange addiction due to the fact that the spice is in their food, water and the very air that they breathe. 
The Fremen have other physiological changes that have occurred due to their long-term adaption to the environment on Arrakis. In Children of Dune, Leto II, who unlike his father is a true Fremen, observes that from his mother's genes he had that longer, larger, Fremen large intestine to take back water from everything which came its way. In line with their traditions, the Fremen society is organised around a tribal structure with each tribe being based in a siege and led by an individual called a naib, who is often the strongest male individual in the tribe. Fremen customs and law dictate that challenges are made in trial by mortal combat, and the naibs of each tribe are also chosen in this way. Each siege is led religiously by a Sayadina, similar to the Bani Gesserit Reverend Mothers. Jessica is able to take on the role of Sayadina by undertaking the spice agony and receiving the memories of the previous religious leader of Siege Tabar, the Reverend Mother Ramalo. The Bene Gesserit have seeded myths amongst the Fremen as part of their mission area protectiva, and it is in particular the myth of the Madi that Paul and his mother Jessica are able to take advantage of in becoming accepted by the Fremen. Jessica at first fails to realise the import of the particular myth sown on Arrakis by the Bene Gesserit, thinking that they will be at least useful and the Fremen are beautifully prepared to believe. The Fremen's capabilities as a people are almost superhuman, and although they appear to be anachronistic even by the standards of the feudal imperium, their abilities of technological innovation are often greatly superior to those of other peoples. Their martial technologies do not seem to be particularly advanced, but are eminently suitable to the environment that they fight in. When it comes to technologies based around their environment and water collection and preservation, the Fremen are remarkably ingenious. It is noted for example that Fremen still suits are of greatly superior manufacture and efficiency than those of any other kind. The Fremen and the Sardaukar represent two sides of the same coin, offshoots of humanity that are shaped and adapted by the harshness of their environments. Although the Sardaukar are soldiers who are put through a process of the survival of the fittest on the hellish planet Salusa Secundus, this world is not their normal environment, at least not in the short term, and neither do they remain there. After the Sardaukar's defeat on Arrakis, the remnants retire to Seleucia Secundus to become Shaddam IV's bodyguard in exile, ultimately their forces being merged with those of the Fremen, before eventually being disbanded by the God Emperor as he creates his fish speaker army. The Fremen however are a product of natural selection and also to a degree, eugenics. They have successfully adjusted to their environment to such a degree that they have integrated themselves fully within it and have acquired physical characteristics shaped by their ability to adapt and survive in such a hostile world. The Fremen practice of eugenics is also linked primarily to their survivability on Arrakis, as opposed to the creation of any particular race model. In that sense, their abandonment of the disabled is seen as being for the good of the tribe. Although this bears some similarity to, for example, the practice of exposure of unhealthy children by ancient Greek cultures such as the Spartans, there is no phenotypic selection at work. The blind are left to the desert because their inability to travel stealthily threatens the well-being of the tribe. It also seems that this process is voluntary amongst the Fremen. We can see this when both Paul goes into the desert with his blindness, and also when the Reverend Mother Romalo passes on her memories to Jessica when she knows that she is too ill to travel. These examples are indicative of both characters acting for the benefit of their community. The Fremen, following the events in Dune, however, are so intrinsically linked to their environment that as the realisation of their long held dream of terraforming Arrakis into an Eden like world progresses, they become water fat to such a degree that their race declines until the point where they are a pitiful semblance of a once great people. Arrakis changes into an environment where the Fremen no longer need to struggle to survive, as the deserts of Arrakis decline to such a degree that there are only token patches here and there, they become what are known as Museum Fremen no longer a force to be reckoned with or even remotely feared, rather more a by-product of tourism for those interested in the ancient history 
of the days of Muad'Dib. Ultimately, the Fremen are indicative of Herbert's conflicting attitudes towards native peoples and Western civilization, and the relationships that humans have with their environment. The Bene Gesserit, a mystical sisterhood that appears to be organised around religious lines, are the power behind what becomes the ultimate evolutionary paradigm in the Dune series, the Kwisatz Haderach. The Bene Gesserit are until the times following the end of Leto II's reign and the scattering, deeply conscientious of adhering to the prescriptions put in place by the Great Convention following the Butlerian Jihad. As such, they have created a breeding program that could again be seen as a mirror to that of the patriarchal Bene Tleilax. The Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, however, in line with the Great Convention, do not use genetic techniques of biological technologies such as artificial insemination or genetic engineering. The crux of their millennia long breeding program is in fact by means of artificial selection, selecting and breeding individuals of specific noble houses and bloodlines patiently for thousands of years in the desire to create a Kwisatz Haderach. The culmination of this program is to create a male Bene Gesserit that they can control. The Bene Gesserit are one of the key schools of physical mental training developed out of the necessities following the Butlerian Jihad, and although they deceptively maintain the image of a matriarchal religious order, their true focus is politics. The structure of the sisterhood is made up of acolytes, reverend mothers, and follows the leadership of an elected individual known as the Mother Superior. The Sisterhood has members dedicated to producing children as part of their breeding program, and many notable factions, including the Emperor and the Houses of the Landsrat, use the Bene Gesserit to procure wives or concubines, this in itself serving the needs of their breeding program. Jessica, the bound concubine of Duke Leto, for example, was ordered by the Sisterhood to produce only female children to the Atreides. It is her disobedience to this edict that brings about the creation of a Kwisatz Saderach in Paul Atreides one generation early. Similarly, the Emperor Shaddam IV has sired five daughters at the Bene Gesserit's command, and despite his strong desire to produce a male heir, something that is easily within the Bene Gesserit's power to allow, this never happens. The physical mental development that the Bene Gesserit have perfected over the millennia includes prana and bindu training, which allows them to manipulate and control every nerve and muscle in their own bodies, even allowing them to physically adjust at the moment of conception the sex of their children. Prana bindu training allows the Bene Gesserit to take control of their bodies in a manner that is carried to the last possible notch permitted by natural function. This training also facilitates another of the Bene Gesserit's developed abilities, namely those of the voice and the weirding way. The voice, a concept obviously influenced by Alfred Korzybski's theory of general semantics, is described as that combined training originated by the Bene Gesserit which permits an adept to control others merely by selected tone shadings of the voice. Voice allows control over an individual's subconscious, providing of course they have the ability to hear, though continued exposure to its use can allow individuals to build up a resistance to it. Those trained in its ways are also not susceptible to its influences. The weirding way is a means of battle similar to a martial art that combines prana bindu training and the use of voice. Both Paul and his mother Jessica are trained in this way of battle, and it is these skills that make the Fremen see their worth, and allow them to join their tribe rather than take their water. As a Bene Gesserit acolyte develops their Prana Bindu training to such a heightened degree, there comes a time when they must undertake the ritual known as the Spice Agony, in order to become fully fledged Reverend Mothers. This at its very essence is when an acolyte takes the poisonous water of life, made from the bile of a newly drowned sand trout, or Little Maker, as they are known amongst the Fremen. The Bene Gesserit undertaking the Spice Agony must realise that the water of life is in fact a poison, and adjust it at a molecular level using their Prana Bindu training in order to make the deadly bile safe. If they are unsuccessful, 
they suffer an agonising death. It is forbidden for a Bene Gesserit to take the water of life when pregnant, as it creates what is known as an abomination. An abomination is a child who is born fully aware and possessing other memory due to the process of becoming a Reverend Mother being passed on to the offspring in the womb while taking the poisonous water of life. More often than not this leads to terrible madness due to the horde of personalities contained in other memory vying for prominence over the individual's own personality. This occurs to Paul's sister Alia, whose mind is taken over interestingly enough by the memory personality of the deceased Baron Harkonnen, her maternal grandfather. Upon successfully changing the poisonous water of life, an acolyte has in fact become a full Reverend Mother, this change giving them access to the special ability of other memory, a form of collective unconscious and genetic memory that is specifically limited to the female sex. At the point of death or prior to an event that may result in a Reverend Mother's death, they are also able to pass on their memories to the collective whole by sharing their memory with another member of the sisterhood. In dire circumstances the sisterhood can facilitate a mass sharing in order to preserve the memories of a large group of Bene Gesserit who face imminent peril. This is known as Extremis Progressiva and is used in Chapter House Dune when the Bene Gesserit planet of Lampadas faces destruction at the hands of the Honoured Matres. It is of such importance to the Bene Gesserit that their Bashar, Miles Teg, is prepared to hold off the enemy for as long as possible in order to allow the escape of Lucilla, the lone reverend mother who carries these collective memories. Millions of memory lives, all concentrated in what the sisterhood called Extremis Progressiva, 2x2 two two, then 4x4 four four, and 16x16, sixteen sixteen, until each held all of them and any survivor could preserve the precious accumulation. What they were doing in Mother Superior's suite had some of that flavour, the concept no longer terrified Morbella, but it was not yet ordinary. Odrad's words comforted. Once you have fully accommodated to the bundles of other memory, all else falls into a perspective that is utterly familiar, as though you had known it always. Morbella recognised that Teg was prepared to die in defence of this multiple awareness that was the sisterhood of the Bene Gesserit. Lucilla later faces capture at the hands of the honoured Matres on Gamu, and is able to hide for a while amongst a group of Jews, despite putting them at great risk. She knows they will ultimately be forced to turn her over to the honoured Matres and able to ensure their survival, but strikes a deal which allows her to share the collective memories of the sisterhood from Lampadas with a wild reverend mother of the Jews, called Rebecca. Lucilla is turned over after the sharing and Rebecca is able to return the Lampada's hoard as it becomes known to the sisterhood. Rebecca is of particular interest here in the development of the Bene Gesserit as she is a naturally evolved reverend mother with the capabilities of other memory and as such has become so without the need of years of training or the spice agony. The reverend mothers of the sisterhood possess other abilities which include the development of truth sayers and imprinters. Truth sayers are trained to observe tone, inclination and body language of a given individual by observing minutiae to an incredible degree, noting the slightest change in an individual's physiological or mental state. The Bene Gesserit's imprinters are able to control an individual using prana bindu techniques and a honed set of skills focused around seduction. The Bene Gesserit represent a heightened form of human being, where the advantages of their seemingly advanced state of existence are fundamentally as a result of cultured training developed over thousands of years. Generally, the greater abilities that the Bene Gesserit possess, like most of the disparate groups of the Imperium, are reliant on the drug Melange. The character of Rebecca is indicative that the nature of the Bene Gesserit is about to follow an evolutionary shift, her being a wild Reverend Mother, who seemingly has a natural predilection for the most prized of the sisterhood's talents, that of other memory. The Bene Gesserit themselves are one of the sources that create the Honoured Matres, the other being the God Emperor's Fish Speaker Army. These groups left the Imperium at the time of the scattering, 
and it is their return as the honoured matres that seemingly pose the greatest threat to the former Imperium at the time of events in Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune. The Bene Gesserit's ability to delve into the realms of other memory is seemingly their greatest advantage, providing them with a store of memories and experiences of most of the women that came before them, going back thousands of years. They can combine this with their talent for what is known as simuflo, where they are able to probe the experiences and opinions of several personalities from within their other memory simultaneously. The purpose of the Sisterhood's great patience and toil, their millennia long breeding program, is to create the Kwisatz Haderach. This ultimately enables them to gain access and to control the male line of other memory. When an acolyte goes through the spice agony, viewing in the mind's eye the multitude of personalities contained therein, there is a place inside that they cannot look, and is a source of terror and uncertainty for them. Only the Kwisatz Sadarak may look there. Unfortunately for them, by accident and an act of disobedience, the Sisterhood loses control of their breeding program. When the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam tests Paul at the beginning of June, she asks him if he knows of the drug that the Bene Gesserit takes to determine truth. The drug's dangerous, she said, but it gives insight. When a truth sayer is gifted by the drug, she can look many places in her memory, in her body's memory. We look down so many avenues of the past, but only feminine avenues. Her voice took on a note of sadness. Yet there's a place where no truth sayer can see. We are repelled by it, terrorised. It is said a man will come one day and find in the gift of the drug his inward eye. He will look where we cannot, into both feminine and masculine pasts. Your Kwisatz Haderach? Yes, the one who can be many places at once, the Kwisatz Haderach. Many men have tried the drug, so many, but none has succeeded. The Kwisatz Haderach, or the shortening of the way, is the pinnacle of human evolution as desired by the goals of the Bene Gesserit's artificial selection breeding program. The Kwisatz Haderach to Frank Herbert represents an exceptionally dangerous superhuman, and is in many ways a subtle critique of both the trends becoming popular in science fiction from the 40s onwards, as well as the inherent dangers in blindly following leaders who are exalted by the general population. When Paul innocently asks the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam, You say maybe I'm the Kwisatz Haderach, what's that? A human gone Jabbar? He little realises he is quite correct. The Bene Gesserit view the Kwisatz Sadarach as the person who can be in many places at once, possessing the ability to see into both male and female other memory. The Bene Gesserit breeding program that is intended to produce the Kwisatz Sadarach is essentially disrupted by Jessica when she bears a son to the Atreides, and thus bringing the culmination of the plan into being one generation early. The Bene Gesserit had intended Jessica to bear a female child to the Atreides, with the notion of breeding her with the Baron Harkonnen's nephew, Fade Rautha. The union of the Atreides daughter and Harkonnen male would then produce a male child who would become the Kwisatz Sadarach and who would be under the control of the Bene Gesserit. Unbeknownst to Jessica, as the Bene Gesserit often conceals the heritage of individuals involved in the breeding program, the Baron Harkonnen is actually her biological father. There are a number of characters in the Dune series who can be viewed as potential Kwisatz Haderachs, failed Kwisatz Haderachs, or even those who are something beyond the original intent of such a being. Paul himself, supposedly the first Kwisatz Haderach, tells his mother that he is in fact not what the Bene Gesserit have sought to create. As his mother considers the fact that he may be in fact the culmination of the sisters' breeding program, he tells her that he is in fact something else. Jessica pressed her hands to her mouth. Great mother, he's the Kwisatz Sadarach. She felt exposed and naked before him, realising then that he saw her with eyes from which little could be hidden, and that, she knew, was the basis of her fear. You're thinking I'm the Kwisatz Sadarach, he said. Put that out of your mind. I'm something unexpected. 
Paul does, however, admit to being the Kwisatz Sadrach, although there is also the implication that he is indeed something more. At one point, describing his own self as a seed, while he realises that he has some terrible purpose. He does, however, admit, as his abilities develop, that he can deny it no longer. In a sense, the breeding program of the Bene Gesserit is not just created to serve the Sisterhood's needs, preferring as they do to operate in their political intentions from behind the scenes. In the years following the Butlerian Jihad, humanity has flourished and diversified, but as the Imperium settled over a period of thousands of years, mankind is finally stagnating. The Kwisatz Sadarak is indeed a human, or rather post-human, Gom Jabbar, who will become the crucible that helps sort the wheat from the chaff in order to help mankind survive some previously unforeseen disaster. Paul as a Kwisatz Sadarak has more than the Bene Gesserit abilities learned under his mother's tutelage and the powers granted him by other memory. That which is unforeseen in him is his ability of almost complete prescience, showing him the paths that lie ahead for humankind. Here was the race consciousness that he had known once as his own terrible purpose. Here was reason enough for a Kwisatz Sadarak or a Lisan al Ghaib, or even the halting schemes of the Bene Gesserit. The race of humans had felt its own dormancy, sensed itself grown stale, and knew now only the need to experience turmoil in which the genes would mingle and the strong new mixtures survive. All humans were alive as an unconscious single organism in this moment, experiencing a kind of sexual heat that could override any barrier. Paul's transition from talented, well trained, and educated ducal heir to that of Kwisatz Sadarak does not happen overnight and is in fact a slow and painful process for the youth. His relocation to the planet Arrakis has a great deal to do with his gradual development as the spice melanges everywhere, saturating food, drink, and even the air he breathes. This helps in slowly altering Paul's awareness. There are indications of his prescient vision and truth sense from the early stages of the novel, but it is not until he faces the crucial trial of drinking the water of life in the spice agony that he reaches the complete potential of a fully realised Kwisatz Haderach. Paul, after drinking the water of life, remains in a coma for three weeks, an unusual length of time for the spice agony. The following passage occurs immediately after Paul awakens from his coma and he reveals to his mother the true nature of the Kwisatz Sadarak and his terrible purpose. It is immediately after this awakening that Paul takes decisive action against all opposing parties involved with Arrakis and spice production, leading his Fremen armies against them and threatening to destroy the source of Melange once and for all. Paul! Jessica screamed. He grabbed her hand, faced her with a death's head grin, and he sent his awareness surging over her. The rapport was not as tender, not as sharing, not as encompassing as it had been with Ali and with the old Reverend Mother in the cavern, but it was a rapport. A sense sharing of the entire being. It shook her, weakened her, and she cowered in her mind, fearful of him. Aloud, he said, You speak of a place where you cannot enter? This place which the Reverend Mother cannot face, show it to me. She shook her head, terrified by the very thought, Show it to me, he commanded. No! But she could not escape him. Bludgeoned by the terrible force of him, she closed her eyes and focused inward, the direction that is dark. Paul's consciousness flowed through and around her and into the darkness. She glimpsed the place dimly before her mind blanked itself away from the terror. Without knowing why, her whole being trembled at what she had seen, a region where a wind blew and sparks glared, where rings of light expanded and contracted, where rows of tumescent white shapes flowed over and under and around the lights, driven by darkness and a wind out of nowhere. Presently, she opened her eyes, saw Paul staring up at her. He still held her hand, but the terrible rapport was gone. She quieted her trembling. Paul released her hand. It was as though some crutch had been removed. She staggered up and back, would have fallen had not Chani jumped to support her. 
Reverend Mother, Chani said, what is wrong? Tired, Jessica whispered. So tired. Here, Chani said, sit here. She helped Jessica to a cushion against the wall. The strong young arms felt so good to Jessica. She clung to Chani. He has, in truth, seen the water of life? Chani asked. She disengaged herself from Jessica's grip. He has seen, Jessica whispered. Her mind still rolled and surged from the contact. It was like stepping to solid land after weeks on a heaving sea. She sensed the old Reverend Mother within her, and all the others awakened and questioning. What was that? What happened? Where was that place? Through it all threaded the realisation that her son was the Kwisatz Satirak, the one who could be many places at once. He was the fact out of the Bene Gesserit dream, and the fact gave her no peace. What happened? Chani demanded. Jessica shook her head. Paul said, There is in each of us an ancient force that takes and an ancient force that gives. A man finds little difficulty facing that place within himself where the taking force dwells, but it's almost impossible for him to see into the giving force without changing into something other than man. For a woman, the situation is reversed. Jessica looked up, found Chani was staring at her while listening to Paul. Do you understand me, mother? Paul asked. She could only nod. These things are so ancient within us, Paul said, that they're ground into each separate cell of our bodies. We're shaped by such forces. You can say to yourself, yes, I see how such a thing may be, but when you look inward and confront the raw force of your own life unshielded, you see your peril. You see that this could overwhelm you. The greatest peril to the giver is the force that takes. The greatest peril to the taker is the force that gives. It's as easy to be overwhelmed by giving as by taking. And you, my son, Jessica asked, are you one who gives or one who takes? I'm at the fulcrum, he said. I cannot give without taking, and I cannot take without. He broke off, looking to the wall at his right. The role of the Kwisatz Sadarach, then, is to guide humanity down the golden path, the desired route to a future that ensures humanity's survival via harsh oppression and the death of billions. Those that survive it will emerge stronger and more varied, allowing humanity to persist. Humanity will survive the rigours of the golden path, which is in itself a form of universe-wide natural selection created by the ultimate predator. It is Paul's ultimate failing that as much as he initiates the golden path, creating his own religion with fanatical warriors who depart on an eleven-year genocidal jihad, he is unable to see it through. It is the price that he must pay which is too great, completely sacrificing his humanity in order to save mankind, that prevents him from carrying out the golden path. It is his pre-born son Leto II who is capable of making such a sacrifice, becoming the almost completely inhuman tyrant, the God Emperor, who has the will and determination to carry out the Golden Path. Paul's abilities are not quite the same as his son's, having curiously odd gaps in his prescient vision at key nexus points of the Golden Path. At the critical moment of action in the narrative of Dune, where he faces the Emperor and slays Fade Rautha, his future is uncertain. When the Emperor Shaddam IV asks his companion and chief intriguer, Count Hazemir Fenring, to kill Paul, the two individuals study each other using the Bene Gesserit skills they have been taught, and Paul realises that his opponent is invisible to his prescient sight because he is a potential Kwisatz Haderach. The Count focused on Paul, saying with eyes his Lady Margot had trained in the Bene Gesserit way, aware of the mystery and hidden grandeur about this Atreides youth. I could kill him, Fenring thought, and he knew this for a truth. Something in his own secretive depth stayed the Count then, and he glimpsed briefly, inadequately, the advantage he held over Paul. A way of hiding from the youth, a furtiveness of person and motives that no eye could penetrate. Paul, 
aware of some of this from the way the time next is boiled, understood at last why he had never seen Fenring along the webs of prescience. Fenring was one of the might have beens, an almost Kwisatz Saderach, crippled by a flaw in the genetic pattern, a eunuch, his talent concentrated into furtiveness and inner seclusion. A deep compassion for the Count flowed through Paul, the first sense of brotherhood he'd ever experienced. In June Messiah, the Benny Tleilax face dancer, Skytail, reveals to his fellow conspirators that the Tleilaxu had also bred a Kwisatz Saderach using their techniques of genetic engineering. Irulan asks him how the Tleilaxu were able to control their Kwisatz Saderach, to which the face dancer informs her that they were not. He informs her that their Kwisatz Saderach preferred to die rather than become the antithesis of the representation of his self. The suicide of the Tleilaxu Kwisatz Saderach echoes strongly the idea of Samuel Butler's pre erewhonian civilization, the race of men who had come before their descendants and had all died off within a few short months. It is not stated in Erewhon whether these men killed themselves, but it can be safe to propose that this was the author's unspoken suggestion, in that he quite specifically mentions that their deaths were caused by the misery their prescience brought them. <laughs>